You got their speaker on? Yes, I get to get their get their speaker on. I tried had these last time, but it didn't, it didn't work. I don't know if it's gonna work this time, but we'll give it a crack. So this is uh, the Irish and British podcast. He texted me last night, said I'm frying, let's get a coffee, and I said, let's do a podcast. Yeah, you hijacked me basically into this beautiful space. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. Glad you like it. So you, you're from Fermanagh, went to before, but you live in England? That's right, yeah. And um, you need English now? I don't know what I am, to be honest with you. Sometimes people here accuse me of being a blowout, <laughs> which yeah. is the reverse of somebody who comes here and pontificates about it. It's somebody who was here when the troubles ran hot uh, down at the, near the border in Fermanagh and then left and now observes the um, faltering peace process from afar. Yeah, I'm sure it's frustrating. And is your, is your wife from here? Where's she from? She's from Oxford. Oxford, class. Um, so I know her often by saying I'm going home. <laughs> uh, sometimes accidentally, but often typically, because this is kind of home in a very visceral sort of way. Yeah, I can't, some of my friends have largely left, which I'm just so rude. I can't imagine what it's like not living where you're from. It's just mean. But yeah. you, you, you're, you're going home tonight. You're going home from Anna. I am on the big COVID transmitter from EasyJet this evening over to Bristol. But you, but you want you, but your mum lived in Fermanagh. Yeah, no, I've been down. So you were down there yesterday. Yeah, yeah. I've been down there. We went to Pendorn, went to the seaside. Oh, it's a great time. Yeah, this Lovely. is where maybe certainly the metropolitan meaningless, Could I say that? I have no sense of what it's like to live out on the edge, the edge of the right. union. What what was that like growing up? What, that, what, 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 like, oh. You don't need to get into specifics, but like yeah. it's just outside in the skillet. Yeah, we're, yeah. So it was about five or six miles from the border, yeah. and. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly, I, mean, I grew up and then I left for university in Durham when I was 18. And uh, so I lived through the period of the sort of 70s and uh, you know, into the mid 80s, where um, you know, the troubles was a really significant presence in your life. Yeah. And people being killed, being murdered by um, the IRA predominantly, because the, the, the profile of the killings in Fermanagh uh, was almost exclusively by uh, Republican paramilitaries. Um, did uh, have a huge impact on your psyche. And I sometimes think that uh, it's never stopped in a way, and that maybe, you know, I need to reconcile some of that in some way and, and put it to bed. And as, as you know, I've done that through poetry, although I don't think that's yeah. made things any better, since all I simply think I can write about is that experience. Yeah, that's how we, that's kind of what brought us together in the first place, because we both. An interest. We were both on social media, both had an interest mm -hmm. in, in, in poetry, John Hughes specifically for me. Um, mm -hmm. You had a blog mm -hmm. and I had a blog. Um, we just bounced back and forth and then we caught up with pints and stuff. Yeah. But, um, Messy so, pints. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, but for, for, it wasn't the John Hughes your man, isn't it? Am I wrong? Yeah, no, I'm a great uh, fan of, of Hughes. Um, and, and he, uh, but people who write about identity and yeah. the, the Torture of identity yeah, yeah. and, the, uh, and the, the suffering that's associated with it, the people who've got a real feel for that. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I think Hewitt and, and Heaney and the people, others, but them in particular, also wrote very eloquently about rural life in the countryside. Yeah. And one of the things that is an enduring kind of um, feature of the violence outside the metropolitan areas, so outside Derry and outside yeah. Belfast and so on. Is how intimate the community yeah. was, and yeah. how cheek by jowl people were, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, you know the, I'm afraid to say the inevitability of people being set up to be killed, oh, or yeah. people having to turn away, yeah. you know, a blind eye, as I've written in some of my poetry, uh, you know, the blind eye maybe bruised shut, uh, bruised you know, shut, through, yeah, through yeah. previous experiences, yeah. so on, meant that somebody that you might have helped with in with your. Uh, Silage, so you know, uh, if your jacket yeah. broke down, might be the, the other, the, the same person that oh uh, looked away. And yeah, you yeah. have to be very careful and sensitive about this because there's just as many um, possibilities on the other side of the equation yeah. for uh, yeah. uh, innocent people being set up uh, who were murdered by uh, loyalist paramilitaries. Yeah. But so I think it is a feature that we don't really talk about enough. Oh, and if there's right. any truth, recovery process, yeah. it will have to be. I mean, one of the things that irritates me, I know I'm way on the rip here, 
One of the things that irritates me immensely about our peace processor industry, TM, yeah. by the way, is the relentless internationalizing yeah. of the solution. We have to get America involved, we have to get Dublin involved, we must get money yeah. involved. Actually, that's not going to solve it. Yeah. That is infantilizing the people who are yeah. here who need to make the peace between themselves. And it's outsourcing. Uh, which we're very good at here. It's outsourcing yeah, yeah. some of the, the, the difficult stuff away. Peace is going to be made here when neighbours across fences, uh, you know, across townlands yeah. and villages and streets sit down and explain and seek forgiveness for the horrors that they have visited on each other and, and, and enabled. Yeah, so we were sort of saying before, I was trying to say that I want to keep this kind of lighthearted. <laughs> talking about, look. yeah, talking about identity, yeah, yeah, um, the dual identity I have and the, yeah. the, that you have, yeah. But now you steer back to that if you want to, but let me just ask this quickly, um, yeah. because I guess in the urban ar ar urban arena yeah. of the conflict, there wasn't that intimacy of, of knowledge and connection, neighbors and so on. What, right? So. I, I would notice, you know, young Republicans when Bobby Story passed and no man has done done more to uh, bring the people outside in together and you're just sort of thinking, yeah, you know, what what history are you reading? Um, it's a and it's a problem. It's 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 a sort of upside down world. Yeah. Um, it was very noticeable when you had you passing a cube, Jerry yeah. Adams and all the media was leaving the people yeah. out the tributes to him. Yeah. One thing that I point out time and time again that these people who try to say that Adams worked for peace is that in the 80s, when UUP and SDLP were coming together, mm. I heard that it was a specific policy to strike fear into the board, especially the board people, was the, was the targeting of um, yeah, the people right on the very edge of border Protestants to, to yeah. sow that mistrust and hatred yeah. into the community. Yeah, I, it's, I think that is true. And I think, you know, there's been many people who, uh, academics have looked at this and who, you know, I think we bandy about ethnic cleansing and uh, genocide and things like that far, far too blindly. Yeah. Um, we're not talking about anything like that, we're not talking about scale, and we're probably not talking about strategy in the widest sense, but yeah. there's absolutely no question in, in Fermanagh that there was a cynical attempt to push Protestants away from the border, yeah. between the border. Yeah. Take that as zone where, uh, for example, the IRA could operate with impunity yeah. and take on the, the uh, British Army. Um, so I, I think it's not to suggest uh, you know, that that wasn't in play. And again, it comes down to that sort of intimacy of pushing people out, because you know what we are here is the sometimes the ground we hold. Yeah. So that had a tremendous psychological uh, impact on uh, the local Protestant community who did feel themselves absolutely under siege from a relentless and apparently unstoppable onslaught of, of murder by the IRA. Um, so I, that, that still feels very real and very unresolved. But the really interesting feature of that, and I think it, again, if we're talking about the difference between uh, the urban and, and the rural sort of situation during the Troubles is, uh, that did not stimulate a backlash yeah. to the extent, to anything like the extent that was, I think, expected and, yeah, yeah. and indeed hoped for. By some of the most cynical characters in the world. as well, yeah. for. Yeah. And you know, whole, whole families, the, the, the Graham brothers, for example, is a, uh, an example of you know, mercilessly cutting down uh, uh, a family who were, I think, in the, all of them were in the part time EDR by targeting them off duty and killing them one after the other. Yeah. And that sort of psychological tone is almost impossible to comprehend, but it was certainly done deliberately. But there wasn't a backlash, and I think that is a feature of uh, the, the, the resilience of that community and the goodness of that community, that they did not permit loyalist paramilitaries to then start operating uh, on, on their behalf, as it were. Yeah. One of the things that um, continually disgusts me, I think, about uh, loyalist terrorism is this idea that somehow I'm complicit because they were acting in my name yeah. to carry out some of the uh, atrocities that yeah, they yeah. did, and I you know, reject that mm -hmm. eternally. Yeah. Um, but you could see conditions where that might have been possible, and indeed there were there were possibly other areas, uh, North Armagh and so on, where that was yeah. uh, a feature. But it didn't seem to happen in Fermanagh. 
And I think there's a sort of, I, I don't know, maybe I'm being naive here or looking at it back through those tinted glasses, but there is a sort of innate goodness to people there. There, there wasn't the polarisation of, of politics, it was much more nuanced. I mean, the, the, across religion and politics, the relationships that people had, yeah. often built around farming, albeit what I've previously said there, yeah. built around those links where it didn't really matter you know, what foot your neighbour kicked with, yeah. you needed something done. And you know, my father was a trade unionist. Uh, he was a shop steward for Newgate, he was an ambulance striker, and, and he was in the um, police reserve before that, uh, and, and so on. And he, he was a, definitely a unionist, in fact, he had every stripe, orange, purple, yeah. black, rainbow, uh, lodges and so on, he, he, he belonged to. So I'm not suggesting he was a, in some way a kind of um, neutral person, but at the same time, um, because of his trade union strip work, and because of the composition of the, the ambulance service in Enniskillen, um, was, there was a, a much better relationship between people. And I'm convinced that if you'd taken the politics out of, sorry, if you'd taken the sectarian dimension out of politics and Fermanagh, my father, given the people that he knew, would yeah. probably voted for the SDLP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because there were some really, uh, really decent and effective councillors whose worldview um, upset the, the, the sectarian, ethno nationalistic dimensions of, of, of the conflict was very similar to, to his own. Yeah, and with, with that um, um, being out there, I was saying in, in a scale, needed the, the, the ambulance. Yes. And so you said yes, when you're in one door. <coughs> yeah. So we give him a good friend, Aaron Callum, who I hope, hope to have on uh, mm. this podcast at some stage. Councillor from Nimbuadi, mm. he was down in Cork and in the line of West. Um, and I was like, oh, the three Irishmen, and you know, another character, mm. like Quincy Duke, another um, interesting character, orange man. He, he loves nothing more than driving down uh, the Leitrim mm. or something for the day. Mm. Um, so, we tell people about the Leitrim. <sighs> I've got a mission not to tell anybody about the Leitrim because it's one of the most beautiful. Um, under visited counties. Yeah, in Ireland, I think I don't want people to come down there. But I, but I, I was just there yesterday. What's the time? Like, what's the big town in in, in Leitrim? I knew that. Was it M? What's it in Leitrim? The big town. We're not talking about Monaghan. No. no. What's the biggest town in Leitrim? Are the main spot the capital or whatever you call it? Capital of Leitrim. I, I don't know. Uh, Means uh, M, I think. It's so come to me. I guess the, the, the prejudice is against unionists is that they, they stay within. We have what we hold, and they stay within. Six pounds yeah. in Northern Ireland, yeah. which I guess, and, and you would have, as, as you're in Leitrim and you're in yeah. Dorne yesterday, growing up, you would have saw nothing in going in and out of the border then? Well, it was always an adventure. Yeah. Because obviously, if you, I mean, we spent a lot of my childhood at uh, Dorne, with Snyla, in Dundalk, yeah. um, down Colin Kill, you know, Ballina, Ballantra, all up around oh, that. Yeah. That's a very nice moor as well, um, which is, of course has its own tale yeah. to tell. But um, it, it wasn't mentioned because you were obviously crossing a, a frontier. Yeah. Uh, if you drove down the, the Loch Shore Road, which is the direct route west from Enniskillen across the border, there was a uh, British Army permanent vehicle checkpoint yeah. just short of the leak, yeah. uh, which you know, w- would, wouldn't be out of place in Afghanistan. Yeah. Right? And indeed, as that architecture became more sophisticated, that's from stuff that is still stuck in my head yeah. in some ways. Um, because of attacks and so on, so the, the, the troops would withdrew to a heavily defended barracks up on the hill, and then yeah. everything was automated and so on. You know, it was a, it was an experience, uh, and one that I can't adequately sort of describe to my teenagers, for example, so you, who've been over and have driven that same journey with yeah. absolutely no, no no indication really of where you cross the border apart from the. I've no experience of that. So any any time, every single time you cross the border as a child, there was some sort of checkpoint or. Well, unless you took one of the unapproved roads, okay. which was a great euphemism. Okay. Uh, it was a road you could still take, but um, for customs purposes, uh, you know, it wasn't approved because the customs station yeah. there on the main routes that normally yeah. had the checkpoints and, and but, so on. Would this have been like a once a week, once a month thing going? Oh, we, we certainly would have gone uh, two or three times a month in the summertime. It was yeah. a great you know, adventure. So my kind of sense of good times, holidays, spending time with, with different people and so on, being a teenager, going and sort of hanging out in caravans and so on by the seaside, is all kind of situated in, in going to Donegal and going across the border. Yeah. Uh, and so it was, it was very available to me. It was, and it, I suppose, 
broke down that sense of, of difference, even though, of course, you know, everything was different from yeah. the, the currency of yeah, the yeah. still is when you use the funds, from the shape of the chocolates, you know. Yeah. And there, there was a kind of excitement about all of that, yeah. which, um, you know, do doesn't outweigh the kind of menace, if yeah. you like, of going through this extraordinary checkpoint uh, to, to get there. And that, you know, those are some of my fondest memories of childhood are definitely, you know, in the south, as it were, yeah. or albeit yeah. travelled north, ironically, yeah. to, to get to where and we were. Did you have any friends or family across the border? Um, I'm just trying to think. Um, I, I don't think we had, I know my dad's folk were from a couple of generations back, were from Longford. Mm. So I've often wanted to sort of follow that up yeah. and so on. Um, uh, I know my, my mother's side weren't uh, from, from down that way, but um, you know, we, we talked about identity and, and, and passports and so on. Um, you know, quite recently for pragmatic reasons, frankly, um, because I am I'm a sort of reconciled remainer unionist, if you yeah. like. Um, but I was a remainer, I voted for remain. Yeah. And actually, in order to help the work that I do, which is still largely in and around the European Union, mm -hmm. I applied for and obviously got an Irish passport. And I wrote about this, and it felt at the time a little bit sort of transgressive, like I was sort of somehow surrendering something or whatever. Yeah. But the actual point of getting that passport when it arrived was completely different. It really surprised me. It felt like almost like a missing piece of the jigsaw. Yeah. It didn't stop me for a second being any more British than I feel now. Yeah. But it did kind of balance that out with a kind of a, a formalisation of the other identity that I have. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know my um, poetry blog, which is yeah. called 51% British, yeah, 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 yeah. troubles out of my head. You know, that, that for me is you know, an important part of my identity, the Irishness of my identity. Yeah. And for years, um, largely because of physical force republicanism, yeah, yeah. and let's be blunt about it, I was completely denied and put off having so as, as a child, as a child, like what this is, a young teenager, yeah. when, when you're just coming into the world and find yourself, were, were you hardcore just British only? I would never say it was hardcore, but that, that's part, but it was a solid, enduring part of my, my um, sense of identity, the Britishness. But were you Irish as a teenager? I probably wasn't, and that has been a growing, dawning kind of um, awareness. Was that more going to Durham, going over, over across? I think being away helped. Yeah. Because actually, you know, I, I've never, you know, I, I, you know, maybe I've just been exceptionally lucky. I've never been subjected to any form of racism because of my perceived identity <laughs> yeah. in, in England. Ever. And like sometimes I look at these, I look at people who write about, you know, how tortured they are. There's, there's quite a lot of them on Twitter, isn't them? Isn't there? You didn't see see the, the Twitter bitch fest I was having this morning. I said the whole yeah. no blacks, no dogs. No I was recovering from my hangover this morning, writing a piece for Cap X at the same time. So no. I didn't, I didn't say it's a flat out spoof, but I said it's largely a spoof because whatever, however real it may be, it may have been in a few instances, it's by and large completely, totally, I don't know about the elephants that I pointed out here, but it's, 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 it's in, it's, it's pushed, it's, it's, it's the, the usefulness has gone, just being exaggerated yeah. beyond any use. Well, it's been turned into a parable. Yeah. Uh, the, the idea that the Irish were the, were the sort of blacks of Europe and so on is actually offensive to anybody who's suffered uh, real racism because of their skin colour, for example. So it has been. I mean, it, it, I'm not denying the fact that you know the, the sign said it to the no blacks of Ireland. That means, like, I, I, if you look into that, I don't know if that. Say that happened in one house in London. Oh, I'd say it was more likely. Oh, was it? Was it common? And I'd, I'd say that it was a default as well. Oh, yeah? But we're talking about... In the 60s? We're talking about 40 years ago. Yeah. So, but there are, people, there, are people now, there are people now who will try to continue to kind of yeah. keep that going. Because it's a, it's a useful mechanism to just project their, yeah. their political worldview. Yeah. And I mean, all I, all I can say is I never suffered from yeah, it. Yeah. And maybe that helped as well. But the important thing I think to say about a dawning kind of... Um, uh, embracing of my Irishness, which I'm now proud of, and which I now see as an integral part of my identity, albeit uh, probably you know in the balance slightly less than my British yeah. identity, but still absolutely sort of there. That could that was created, I, I guess, for me personally, 
during the time when you know, the executive was set up, it looked like we were on our way somehow to having a, a settled society at ease with itself. It was work in progress and all the rest of it. Particularly when we had the, the, the Malin Trimble uh, yeah, yeah. axis, uh, which was really about making this place work. Um, but actually that sense of Irish is maybe now receding a bit because it's been, to my uh, mind, it's been hijacked by the yeah. nativist bigotry yeah. of Sinn Féin, who you know, don't, for all their uh, ludicrous posturing, including the hilarious uh, you know, appointment of uh, Martina Anderson, a convicted bomber, as head of unionist outreach. Yeah, you know, yeah. I don't know whether that was just you know, postmodern surrealism or, or whatever they were at and so on. But I don't think, generally speaking, Sinn Féin regard unionism or Britishness as a viable identity or that it's equal value of theirs, whatever they're saying. Yeah, yeah. And I think as long as Sinn Féin and the Irish government understand this perfectly, various iterations of it yeah. that aren't involving Sinn Féin, that um, they are the greatest impediment to Irish unification on the island. Yeah. And as long as they are a driving force for, uh, you know, heavily identified with any project, a, a discussion isn't even viable. Uh, about what a new Ireland would look like. Uh, you know, obviously all of this is very germane at the moment because of uh, what's happening over Brexit and the impact of Brexit, which I, I certainly thought was going to loosen the bonds of the Union and, and, and so on yeah. disappear. But you know, they're, they're, that was the chink of the armour then that, that led um, this, this new relentless project about pushing uh, unification yeah. very dangerously, in my view. So if, you know, if people want unification, it's a perfectly viable, um, sorry, that's not the right word, it's a perfectly honourable and intriguing, actually, uh, to a union, it's an intriguing position to have. They need to decommission Sinn Féin out of the first place. Yeah, because which, otherwise you will never have a proper, um, authentic or honest conversation with your neighbours because yeah. they have too much blood on their hands. Uh, and there's too much history there, and they're changing their past as well. Of yeah. As progressive as they would like to see themselves in this project for a new Ireland, they are chained to their past. They're chained to their nativist bigotry. Yeah. And their thoughts and their orations, you know. Yeah. And the, and, the, and the veneration of people who caused exceptional suffering. Yeah. To the community that they are now supposedly trying to encourage into a conversation about a new Ireland, it's just absolutely a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, I, I was quite self-conscious doing this podcast and still am to a degree, but um, some of the feedback has been fantastic. Um, though, well, that was stop though. <laughs> well, though, um, there was a Republican commentator uh, character on Twitter. I, I can't really remember exactly what he was saying, but his whole angle and another guy was that this idea that the English laugh at people in Northern Ireland saying they're British and saying they're not Irish and this just this whole tone of come on of course you're Irish like how can you not be mm. but it just baffles me that at the same time it doesn't register that there's a reason why there's a reluctance to Irishness because they have formulated such a narrow prescriptive form of Irishness mm. Mm. I think before partition before 1916 um, and one of the reasons why 1916 happened was because the radicals could see just how content the great majority seemed to be with yeah. them in the union. Home rule would have been from yeah. the union. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you look at Northern Ireland football, it's the Irish Football Association. Yeah. If you look at the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland, it is. Yeah. Or if you look at Donegal, it's the Grand. Yeah. And I'm sure there's there's many other um, sort of pre-partition um, institutions yeah. that are of that nature. Um, so. The, for me, the big problem is it's the nar it's not only the, the the violence that was associated with Irishness, but mm. the narrowness and the prescriptiveness mm. of um, the the Ar Irishness. Yeah, I, no, I agree. I mean, you know, Sinn Féin don't own my Irish identity, nor will they have any part in what whatever it becomes. But I I I hope it remains a, a kind of central part of my 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 own sense of identity. Yeah, I think but, but when you have, sorry, uh, but you know, as long as you have people who are trying to impose that narrow Irish identity on you, with freighting with yeah. all the suffering uh, and, and, and futility and bloodshed that has been expended to, to push it, yeah. uh, you know, uh, and it hasn't you know, succeeded through physical force violence, nor is it going to succeed through you know, ideological agitprop. 
And actually, what I would say is, you know, I, I speak to uh, nationalists. I have lots of friends who are uh, nationalists and uh, people I respect great, greatly. And I, I sort of say to them sometimes, you know, you're going to have to be the persuaders here. Yeah, yeah. And in order to do that, you're going to have to sideline these people because they drown out anything else reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's plenty that's reasonable about arguing for a different sort of Ireland, whether that's a federated Ireland, whether it's Ireland and the Commonwealth and all the rest of it. But at the moment, you're simply not going to get anywhere until you take all these people. With any, character, then, with any characters you like? Well, you, you, get, you get them thrown back at you, and I see the, you know, some legitimacy. You get thrown back at you. Uh, but, and this is where it gets honest in my view. It's not, you know, we don't need to be persuaders. Yeah. We just need demographics on our yeah, side. Yeah, I think that's the way it's going. And, you know, in terms of pure legitimacy, yes, that's true. 50% plus one, or 50% plus point one. Mm -hmm. will will get you your uh, unified Ireland, but it won't probably get you a, a unified Ireland that's going to be worth living in, particularly in the old eastern part of it, if you don't deal with this enormous conundrum that, you know, again, some of the peace processors who like to talk about a new Ireland never get to grips with, and that is the conundrum of how do you accommodate unionists in the united ireland when you've extinguished their identity by changing the constitutional arrangements and nobody is really adequately answering that and maybe it's because it's an unanswerable question if it is then i just think the discourse needs to be more honest and yeah. needs to say do you know boys the writing's on the wall here send us your de clerk you know in inverted commas let's negotiate over how you can keep you know the most Funds possible yeah. uh, after your um, constitutional identity has been annihilated, because there is no other way around that. I don't think. Uh, but I've yet to hear anybody coming back. I mean, there's lots of specious, warm words and bromides yeah. about you know an, a, an agreed future and a conversation, all the rest of it. It's largely an echo chamber. You and I yeah. know that. It's largely nationalists talking to other nationalists yeah. and nationalism, and that cannot succeed, in my opinion. Uh, in terms of a, a future that is going to be stable and secure without somehow solving this, uh, I call it Schrodinger's polity, I can't even say it, but Schrodinger's polity of having unionists in the United Ireland but still unionists yeah. simultaneously. Uh, I, I don't know how that works. Yeah. I don't know what solutions there are, except for the people who I think sometimes are quite bracingly honest in a way, Republicans who, who I uh, have a, an exchange with, who just say, you know, demographics will take care of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You just need to um, soften up the, uh, well, not me, because I don't speak for you. Soften up the opposition. Yeah. Uh, or soften up your side so so it can be accommodated. Because otherwise, we're you know we're going to have to deal with you. Yeah. And you can just see that horrible inversion of the, um, the sense of alienation and discrimination that the Catholic minority had in Northern Ireland when it was formed. Yeah. Being sort of flipped round. Yeah. And you know. I don't like shroud waving at all, and I think there's been far too much of that done, but there's certainly, if you listen to people who are doing some research at grassroots level, I mean, we hear a lot of um, uh, young people from Republican areas being highly kind of mobilized and energized by some of the online media stuff yeah. that is uh, venerating yeah. uh, the IRA and, and, and some of the awful things that they did. Yeah. That doesn't exist in a vacuum. Yeah. You, you have, I think, on the other side, a mobilisation of yeah. young unionist people who are now starting to talk in terms of the, the covenant. Yeah. You know, in talking in terms of you know uh, everybody laughed at the UDF until you know, they went and saw them. Yeah. You yeah. Know, this kind of militaristic discourse is is starting, and unless it's you know we handle things very very carefully, it I think will will be a feature. Now, whether or not that would ever be a game changer to United Ireland remains to be seen. Um, it certainly wouldn't stop it if, again, the, the arithmetic was right. But what sort of place would you have yeah. if you simply reverse that feeling, that yeah. legitimate, legitimate feeling of, of, of alienation? Yeah, sectarian headcount, 50% plus one, it's just mm -hmm. not the way forward. Um, I'm low on battery, I'm just going to check this. You're low on time. I yes. just want to make one quick comment, if I can, yeah. because it, it, it's, it's sort of eating in my stomach and my head. Mm -hmm. It ties in what you're saying, and then uh, if you want to just maybe a last comment and then we'll wrap it up. So tie it in with what you're saying that um, all this, for all this talk of a shared Ireland, a great Ireland, mm. there's nothing actually sincere. Um, 
I was reading in the Sunday Times the other no, week. I, I, I wouldn't say that. I said there's a, I'd say there's a huge amount of sincerity okay. about that. But there's quite a lot of naivety as well. Yeah. And there's quite a lot of misunderstanding. Talking, there's quite a lot of talking to yourself about it. Yeah. Uh, which cuts out the most important people in a way in this whole equation, which is the people whose identity you will be changing. Yeah. Whose, whose identity is antithetical to your solution. Because yeah. you obviously be changing the identity of, to some extent, of uh, nationalists in Northern Ireland. Because you'll be getting rid of Northern Ireland. Yeah. But we are a very sort of sour, indigestible lump in the peace processor at the minute. And this yeah, hasn't it's been. And it's indigestible because it's ignored. So mm -hmm. my point uh, would be that reading the Sunday Times, the Screen Ireland, is yes. like they did with 1916, a docudrama, a number of series mm -hmm. looking. At the Easter 1916. Mm. So they're going to do something similar, it looks like, with the treaty negotiations. Right. And it's going to be Michael Collins facing Churchill. Mm -hmm. Now, money, Irish taxpayer money, would be far better spent having Michael Collins talking to James Craig, who they met many times. Mm -hmm. But of course, what I'm seeing is there's a nationalistic historiography down south, a national story narrative mm -hmm. that isn't going to be changed, it, it cannot become, from my, what I'm seeing mm. by examples of this mm. and the RIC thing, mm. it doesn't, it doesn't so want to um, accommodate um, unionism. Yeah. I think you'd be slightly unfair there, I may say, because I was very struck by how balanced and measured the, uh, the centenary, okay. 2016, 1916 uh, uh, commemoration was, was, was fit by official act, yeah. was um, handled. Uh, and I do, I, you know, I do think, on a broader sense, the in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of lyrical level, and I don't, I'm not saying this is their fault. It's just a fact. Um, unionism, the experience of unionism and unionists and those servants of the state, if you like, across the history of the foundation of the Ireland partition and so on to date is very badly served and very underrepresented in terms of art, in terms of uh, you know, uh, documentaries, drama, uh, and so on. And I'm yeah, not sure. Ignored. Well, I don't know whether there's the same groundswell of wanting to tell the story uh, as there is from the other perspective, uh, which which I think is a, a function of if you feel you're held captive in a, in a state and you're resisting the state. From a from a dramatist's point of view, that's much more interesting yeah, than yeah. the uh, guy that you know, got up in the morning in the slippers to go out to uh, answer the door, who's a part-time police officer who was shot in the head by somebody. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and I, I think there's a degree of catching up to do, but the responsibility the responsibility for that doesn't lie anywhere else except in the, the the PUL community. And I think there's an appetite to understand and to hear that story because it is rich. And, and, and multi-layered uh, as anything else. Yeah. One of the brilliant things that was done, uh, so I'm rattling on here, but just to sort of uh, conclude on that sort of note, um, humanising the story of uh, unionism in, during the Troubles, rather than seeing it represented as a sort of easy, lazy caricature of two days. But that's, that's the way, if I read the Irish mm. Times, if I read in Malawi, or whatever, yeah. that well, no, actually seems to be the way well, if you read it in Malawi and nobody else, that's what you might think. But just sorry, just to finish the point that I, I was making. Um, so uh, Pete Sherlow, Professor Pete Sherlow yeah. is a professor of Irish studies at Liverpool University. I negotiated with uh, uh, Pete, who allowed the quilt um, display by the South East Romana Foundation to be put up in uh, Liverpool University as part of the uh, commemoration of 10 years of the Good Friday Agreement at yeah. Liverpool University. One of the things that very simple I don't know if you're aware of it, um, exhibition does, was it's basically people who died in Fermanagh, uh, right. uh, of, of whatever religion, but they mm -hmm. were predominantly because of the, the profile of the killings of Protestants. They were commemorated by a patch and a quilt, mm -hmm. which was designed to, to somehow capture their humanity. What else were they interested in? What else did they do? And it's very poignant and very powerful and very moving in a way. Yeah. Because, you know, so, so one, uh, particular one that sticks in my mind is from a, um, a man who was murdered by the IRA who was very interested in badminton and it's just a badminton racket from yeah. public shopping mall but very intricately done on this little quilt and we need to humanise those yeah. stories. You know, I, I would say the Irish government 
or the state, the Irish state, needs to take an interest in humanising those stories and explaining the complexity yeah. of our island history yeah. uh, and, and, and our conflict. Because in the end, if you want to have a united Ireland, and it may well come in the future, uh, I don't think it's a, a prospect that's close, despite yeah. what all the uh, agitation would, yeah. would suggest, but you know, it has to be built on something better than pl the plague dirt of agit prop and victory. Yeah. It, 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 it will be a lifetime's work for uh, you know, whoever is going to be, um, you know, whoever the good actors are yeah. that are going to come along, that are going to uh, be you know, responsible for doing it. Uh, and it's, it's an immense challenge. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing any one, as I would often say, you know, two buckets of you are carried in one. I don't see anyone that's truly embracing both traditions, working to understand them, promote them. Um, but I, I, would, I would just love to see that. Um, I don't know how this has come across, but hopefully try to show that. Um, so you're going to work in edges as well. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, just, I'm terrified of this battery dying because it oh, right. must look really bad if you didn't sign off. <laughs> if so, I just suddenly disappeared, yeah, I mean, wrap it up. So I'll, I would ask you for all your, your social media and stuff, but we're just too tight for time. So I'll just include them in the links below. Okay. And, uh, or in the description below. So hey, thanks so much for calling. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you and see you again in this wonderful <laughs> space. So thank you for having me. No problem. And um, you, you're saying this is going to go out on call. So yeah. God, God help us. Uh oh. <laughs> Cheers.